Hi, I'm Tyler Farrell with Golf Smart Academy. This webinar, I'm going to present the presentation that I gave at the World Golf Fitness Summit in uh, October of 2016 in New Orleans. The topic is looking at the 3D differences between the driver and the iron swing. Basically addressing the question, is there one swing that you can use throughout the bag or do you need to make adjustments to your swing other than just setup um, when you're going from say a driver to a short iron? Now in this presentation, I'm, I'm going to break it down into two different parts. In the first part, we're going to look at a bunch of 3D graphs. So if you're um, a golf coach or just a, a 3D golf nerd and you want to see some of the data behind the concepts that I tend to teach, um, I'm going to present that for about 15 minutes or so. If you want to just jump to the end, um, you know, if you're not really into the 3D space and you really just want to jump to the end and see some of the before and afters and look at more 2D video um, practical applications, um, I think that that's fine. Um, I'll put a little link here where you can uh, jump right to when we start looking at golf swings instead of looking at 3D graphs. So I'll show you how understanding some of the differences between driver and iron can help you um, make changes. So this was one individual lesson who uh, basically by understanding a different uh, pivot concept was able to completely change his release and ball flight. And then I have another example where we'll go through um, a golfer who was driving the ball really well but struggling with his iron play. Because what I've, what I've noticed um, with both my students as well as myself is it's rare that you have the best um, driver day and the best iron day on the same day. So in this, uh, the rest of this presentation, we're going to take a look at why that might be the case. Um, before I get into the data, I interviewed a number of coaches trying to figure out what they thought might be the difference between the driver swing and the iron swing. Now some coaches uh, continue to stress that there's no difference, it's just set up. Um, but many golf instructors focus on the axis tilt or um, the position of the body and what changes during the swing with a driver and during an iron with an iron. Um, other coaches tend to focus more on what the goals are. So with a driver, you're trying to hit for angles and you're trying to maximize distance. Where with an iron, you're trying to um, strike it solidly and control trajectory and proximity to the hole. Now, a few biomechanists described the, the driver swing as more of a total body activity while the upper uh, the iron swing is more of an upper body activity. Let's look at the data and see which one of ones of these hypotheses the data supports. So before we jump into the data, I want to give a big uh, thank you to John Sinclair for providing some of these uh, Tour Pro folders. Um, I have a lot of uh, driver swings, but he was able to share 31 different uh, Tour Pro folders which had driver, five iron, a short iron, whether it was eight iron through wedge, um, as well as a 30-yard uh, pitch shot. So I was able to analyze some of these patterns and see if it was more of a spectrum or see if they were the same or where it changed and, and come up with some theories as to why. So the first section, we're going to go over the kinematic sequence, some positional changes between the upper and lower body, and then some movements during the release, specifically looking at supination. Again, in the second half of this presentation, you can just jump ahead and see some case studies of how we apply this 3D data because I don't necessarily think every golfer out there needs to understand the 3D data, but if you're a coach, it can be really helpful for helping you uh, think about the, the movement patterns in a, a more specific way. So my goal is to present you with the data and visuals and let you come up with ways that you can teach it. I'm not here to say that there's one perfect way to adjust the swing just because the graphs are a little bit different, um, but I want to get your uh, brain thinking about the actual differences between the two and hopefully you can come up with some creative ways to get your students to make these changes and make it feel as uh, seamless or athletic as possible. Now we know that the angle of attack tends to change throughout the bag. We know that with the short iron it's going to be somewhat down and with the driver it's going to be flat or even up. Um, hopefully up if you're trying to maximize distance. One of the questions is that we've kind of struggled with is, is this purely a setup change, purely a equipment change, or is there an intentional change to how the golfer is trying to swing the club? Hopefully the 3D data will uh, shed a little light on which of these is the case. Now, with the 3D data, I took, to, I took a look at a number of different parameters, um, but in this presentation, 
because I was limited to 45 minutes, I focused on the kinematic sequence changes, the axis tilt changes, which would be, um, we'll look at the differences in the sway graphs, and then the lead wrist looking at supination. But as you can see, if you want to pause this slide, you can see that there were changes in what the body did, in how the club worked, as well as in the arms and the legs. And if you have a good data set, you can take a look at some of these um, patterns as well and see if your data matches the, the data that I was looking at. So the general change in the kinematic sequence, if you are a, if you've looked at uh, 3D and you've seen some of these 3D graphs, you may be familiar with the two on screen. We have kind of the standard or classic uh, full swing kinematic sequence, and then we have the standard or classic 30 yard wedge shot. The 30 yard wedge shot has more of a fanning pattern, more of a cast pattern, um, where the club is moving faster than the arm, the arm moving faster than the torso, the torso moving faster than the pelvis, even though the, the transition sequence is the same. With the full swing, we see more of a downswing loading pattern. So we see more of a um, lower body moving faster than the upper body, upper body moving faster than the arm, arm moving faster than the club to help maximize the speed gains um, and to potentially help with a little bit of the, the path requirements for the driver. The question is, is this more of a switch where you go from driver and all your full swings should look like the top graph and then once you get to these half shots, it switches? Or is it more of a spectrum? Let's take a look at some different full swing graphs to help possibly explain um, that pattern. Is it more of a switch or is it more of a spectrum? The general trend with the kinematic sequence was that the driver swing was more of a loading pattern and then the uh, wedge swing was more of a cast pattern. So we'll look at a number of different examples so you can visualize what I'm talking about. Uh, but while, while each individual golfer kept a little bit of their own signature and their own pattern, you'll see from looking at these graphs that tour pros do make some subtle shifts to how they're applying energy and how they are uh, swinging the golf club within full swings, whether it's a short iron, like an eight iron, nine iron wedge, or a full swing with the driver. It is not exactly the same pattern. What was interesting was tour pros pretty consistently made these changes to their swings where amateurs usually made the same swing with every club in their bag and tended to struggle with one end or the other depending on which end their pattern better matched. So here's how we're gonna look at these graphs. I'm going to put up the driver and the iron version and then we're going to just kind of eyeball some of these differences. I'm not gonna throw a ton of numbers at you. We're just gonna look at the general movement patterns. Now if you've never seen a kinematic sequence graph, basically we have a timeline of the golf swing. So we have a dress, top of the swing, impact finish. So this is all backswing, right here is downswing, and then between these two lines is the follow through. When a line is negative, it's rotating away from the target. When it's positive, it's rotating towards the target. And what we can see is the red line is the pelvis, the green line is the thorax, the blue line is the uh, left arm or lead arm, and then the brown line is the club. So this particular golfer, you can see his lower body change direction when it went from uh, negative to positive, change direction here, clearly before the upper body, then the upper body before the arm, arm before the club, and you can see that the red line is above for part of the downswing, the blue line is above for part of the downswing. That's more of a loading pattern. What we see here is the, when we now look at the wedge swing, we can see that the red and the green kind of change direction together, and the red is underneath the other graphs for the entire downswing. We can see that the blue and the brown are pretty much mirrored on top of each other. If I kind of toggle back and forth, you can see the general shift of being less of a load and more of a cast when we get to the wedge. So here's another golfer, and in this one we'll see primarily a lower body or a hip change. So we can see the red line being well above the green line and kind of going first and faster. And then if we shift, we can see that the red line is now kind of in with going at about the same speed as the other parts of the body, kind of like so. Okay, here's another example of a golfer who makes adjustments to both the hips and trunks. So you can look at that transition starting sequence and we can see pretty clearly that that red line goes from leading the early part of the downswing to now just kind of supporting. And we can see that the 
the torso kind of follows in that same casting pattern as well. Okay, so we see that the Tor Pros tend to use a similar pattern throughout the bag, but it's more of a cast. What about amateurs? Now, amateurs are typically gonna struggle with one end or the other, and more often than not, they struggle with the driver. So here's a um, mid-handicap golfer with their driver, and we can see that it's already a cast pattern. We can see that it's going to be difficult to be, or even if it becomes more of a cast pattern, it's never a loading pattern, which is part of what's required to, to have the proper angle of attack and hit a driver well. So we can see that, yes, the lower body does get a little bit slower, but you can see for all intent and purposes, most of the swing uh, doesn't really change. In fact, if we compare this is his driver, this is his wedge, we can see that the lower body actually has better sequencing and starts earlier with the wedge than it did with the driver. So again, this is an example of a golfer uh, failing to make the uh, changes between a driver and a wedge swing. So this golfer is much better with hitting the short irons than he is with hitting the driver. Here's another golfer who has a pretty clear cast pattern and we can see the shift between these two, you can see that the overall pattern looks about the same. The scale is just a little different, so the graph is kind of jumping around, um, but you can see that the pattern between the two is pretty close to the same. One last example, we've got driver here and wedge here. You can see that if anything, this golfer actually struggles with uh, having more of a load pattern with the wrists with the um, with the wedge here than he does with the driver. So he has more of a cast pattern with the driver than he does with the wedge. Um, with the wedge, he actually demonstrates more of the downswing loading pattern. So this 10 handicap uh, tends to struggle a little bit more with wedge consistency contact. Okay, so we saw that pros made these adjustments to their patterns where amateurs typically kept the same pattern or in one case actually reversed the pattern uh, in the wrong direction. So looking back at our hypotheses, we can rule out that the swings are identical, or at least I'm willing to rule out that the swings are identical and that it's just ball position. I think we've built some support for the case that it's a total body versus an upper body move, and I think we've built some uh, case for the speed versus precision argument, but we haven't done much to address uh, some of the other goals like the angle of attack or the uh, axis tilt or sweep versus strike. So that's what we'll look at next when we talk more about these positions. Now this image up here is the same golfer hitting a full swing with a sand wedge on the right and a driver on the left. Now we can see that there are some different looks to these movements. We can see uh, that the upper body is a little bit more on top of the lower body. There's differences in the extension or the width between the upper body and the hands. And we can see that there's differences in the arm straightening. Now, again, I'm not here to tell you that these need to be intentional differences, but I am gonna show you the data that shows that uh, you do need to make some adjustments if you're gonna have success with both clubs. What I, what I found looking at the general trends is that there is a big difference in the sway pattern. So the sway is the movement of the upper body or the lower body either towards the target or away from the target. So it's not just a bad thing like a sway in the backswing, it's just a, the term we use for the linear movement of the, of the body in that plane. The general pattern was that the irons were more stacked and the driver had more of a tilt away from the target. Most golfers adjusted the thorax while keeping the lower body the same, but um, about, a, or a small percentage adjusted the pelvis while keeping the upper body the same and a handful of them changed both. So, but it was about two thirds of the golfers who kept the lower body or the pelvis pretty consistent and made most of the adjustment with the thorax. There was a difference in both the lift and the thrust pattern, uh, but we're, they're, they aren't as significant, so we're not gonna look at them in this video. Okay, so this golfer is that typical pattern that adjusts the thorax. This graph is now looking at the uh, pelvis sways, thrusts, and lifts. The pelvis sway is the main graph we're gonna look at, which is the red line. So the red line is looking at the linear movement of the pelvis 
towards or away from the target. When it goes negative, it's swaying off the ball or it's moving away from the target. When it goes positive, it is swaying towards the target. Um, so this golfer had a little bit of a weight shift during takeaway and then more of a centered pivot and then shifted towards the target in the downswing and kind of slid on the way through. If you look down at the bottom of the screen, bottom left, you can see the amount of sway at impact. So I have all these graphs uh, kind of frozen at that point in time. So between setup and impact, this golfer shifted 5.4 inches closer to the target for the driver. Now with an 8 iron, this golfer shifted 5.1 inches. So it was a little bit less, but pretty close. And if I toggle back and forth, you can see the overall pattern for the red is pretty consistent, pretty similar between these two. Now if we look at the upper body, it's the same graph, so we're looking at the red line, which is the thorax sway, and we'll see a little bit of a shift during off the ball during the takeaway, and then a little bit of a shift towards the target um, during the early part of the downswing, and then once they've done that little shift towards the target, you'll see with the driver, there's a pretty uh, significant movement away from the target. I refer to that movement as part of the bracing strategy or how they use their body to help stabilize um, and get in the position to deliver the arms in the right way. So this golfer shifted about two and a half inches towards the target and then by the end of their release, so roughly when the club's about parallel, they're about 1.5 inches away from wherever they started. But you can see that between those two, there's a pretty consistent movement away from the target. Now here we have that same golfer with an iron, and we saw that the pelvis was about the same. We can see that the pattern, the shape of the red line between these two looks pretty similar, but we can see that some of the magnitudes are different. So this golfer had about the same shift towards the target during transition. That, that movement helps uh, create the pressure in the lead foot and then during the release, we can see that this golfer didn't shift nearly as much off the ball. In fact, or sorry, away from the target, not off the ball. So this golfer shifted towards the target and then when they made contact, they're about 1.6 inches closer to the target than where they started. So uh, because we're comparing where they started, if a golfer sets up with more tilt and gets more behind the ball with a driver and then sets up more stacked with an iron, we're going to tend to see even with that the upper body is going to get more in front of where they started um, with the iron, where with the driver they're going to work their way more um, behind where they started. So even though they're starting further away, they still work more behind with the driver. But this golfer, if we toggle back and forth, we can see the differences. Even though the pattern looks similar, we can see that this golfer is not shifting their upper body nearly as far off or away from the target during the release. And that creates the difference in the axis tilt. So this golfer had the pelvis move about the same amount, but the, the, there was a, a little over a one inch difference in where the um, position of the upper body was and that helped create the axis tilt different for the driver compared to the short iron. Now here's a second uh, golfer looking at an, another one of the classic patterns of more of the thorax adjusters. So this golfer actually shifted their lower body 3.7 inches with both the driver and the iron. Driver and 9 iron. You can see very little difference in the pattern of the red line. There's a little difference in the pattern of the, the blue line and green line, um, but we're primarily looking at the red line for this section. So now we can go back and forth between the driver and the iron, and we can see, again, that similar shift. So while they shifted about the same amount towards the target to help apply the pressure into the lead foot, we can see during the release with the driver, this golfer works about two and a half inches or a total of about uh, four or five inches away from the target, from the maximum point there to the maximum point there, and at impact, He's about half an inch uh, further away than where he started with the driver. And then with an iron, we can see that he goes from about a little less than two and a half to right around zero. So he has about half the amount of shift away from the target, even though the pelvis was in exactly the same position. So you can see the general slope change as well as the magnitude change.
here's one more thorax adjuster because it's the more dominant pattern. I wanted to show a few examples. So this golfer shifted 7.1 inches towards the target with the driver, seven inches with the uh, eight iron. And again, you can see a pretty consistent pattern or similar looking graphs between these two. That's clearly the same golfer. Now, if we look at the um, adjustment of the upper body, we can see that there's a pretty big difference between the upper body. Now, this golfer doesn't get quite as far away from the golf ball, so this, this golfer is probably gonna, or sorry, away from the target. Um, this golfer is probably going to have more of a downward angle of attack because his upper body is still um, 2.1 inches closer than where it started. He doesn't really have a, a big shift um, away from the target. But with the iron, you can see that it's less so. You can see that this is a more of a gradual slope. It's not quite as sharp. And you can see that he finishes two and a half inches closer. You know, his lowest peak is two and a half inches closer than where he started. So that upper body is definitely shifting more towards the target um, with the iron than he was with the driver. Uh, while the blue and the green stay somewhat consistent. Now, there was a small subset of golfers who tended to adjust the pelvis instead of the upper body. So that looks more like this. With the driver, this golfer, you, if, if I just showed you these two without us looking at the scale, you would say that that's pretty close to the same pattern. But if we look at the values, we can see that in the bottom left-hand corner, with the driver, he's shifted nine inches towards the target with the Pitching weds, he's only shifted 6.3 inches towards the target. So about a three inch difference between where his, uh, his uh, lower body was compared to the start position. So now what we'll see by looking at his upper body is we can see that the upper body graphs tend to have a more consistent pattern. So he, he only had a shift of a difference of about 0.8 inches. So the difference between his lower body and his upper body still increased about two inches um, based on the difference between the driver and the iron, but he did it more by increasing the lower body, not by moving the upper body back. And that two inch, uh, the, the average in the database was about 2.1 inches of uh, additional shift. So now here's uh, the smallest subset was more of the adjuster of both. So neither of them is going to stay the same. They're going to change um, kind of different amounts in order to create that two inch difference between the upper body or the two inch greater difference between the upper body and the lower body for their own pattern. So here we've got golfer going 6.4 inches with the driver and then 5.8 in inches with the iron. And then with the upper body, we can see a similar looking pattern, but his upper body moves about. 0.6 inches closer to the target with the iron than it did with the driver. So he had a little bit of shift from the lower body and a little bit of shift from the upper body and that combo gives him the axis tilt that he's looking for. In general, there's a pretty big difference um, in the pattern when we compare the two ends of the spectrum when we're looking at this axis tilt or we're looking at this sway. Those irons, they tend to be more stacked. so. Uh, you know, just a couple inch difference, whether it's two to four or something like that, uh, difference between the upper body and the lower body. But with the driver, you'll see a much greater difference, especially if you look at the maximum difference, such as at the end of their release, it can be somewhere in the you know, five, six, even up to eight inch difference between the upper body and the lower body. So if your upper body is directly on top of your lower body, you're probably going to struggle with the driver. So what about amateurs? If we look at them, we're gonna tend to see a little bit of change, right? Similar to what we saw with the kinematic sequence. So here's a amateur golfer whose wedge swing, so the, the driver swing, he had an extra inch of shift towards the target. So it went 4.8 to 3.8, but we can see overall the pattern's kind of about the same. So that be fine. It, we're expecting to see a little bit more shift away from the target with the um, with the iron than we do with the driver, and we can see that there's a little bit of a shift, but 
again, these two are also very close. Four inch shift um, with the driver, so we were expecting to see that actually be less than the wedge. He shifted more than the wedge, so the actual difference between the axis tilt stayed about the same because he, he gained some with the pelvis, but then he lost some based on the pelvis and thorax. So both shifted, but the difference was pretty much the same on that case. Now we've got uh, another golfer who we can see has a, about a one inch uh, difference between where the pelvis is. And then if we jump to the lower body, this is the driver, and then this is the wedge. We can see a 1.5 inch difference, but the driver is actually more ahead or closer to the target than the wedge. So he negates um, what he gains with the pelvis. Again, it ends up being about the same relationship. And that's a very consistent pattern that you'll see with kind of the mid handicap level where whatever that axis tilt relationship is with one swing, they'll typically have that with all of their full swings. So amateurs frequently retain those similar axis tilt relationships and that typically causes a problem at one end of the spectrum or the other. Back to our hypotheses, we know that there's some differences, but we're starting to confirm what a lot of the coaches thought. Uh, the one piece that I couldn't really confirm was standing further away from the golf ball, and that's just not measured on the 3D system. Um, but the good news is pros were, or coaches were kind of looking in the right areas, and the, the data is supporting the difference in the patterns of, of the load versus the cast and the more axis tilt versus less axis tilt. So amateurs really just need to learn to adjust a few key parameters in order to have success throughout the bag. Now let's look at one thing that was not mentioned by the coaches, um, but that I think is incredibly useful, which is looking at the amount of supination. Because the what the body does and what happens in the load pattern is typically going to affect what happens in the release and vice versa. So what we're going to look at is just one simple parameter. We're going to look at the blue line. The blue line is looking at pronation supination. When it is negative, it's pronating, and when it's positive, it is supinating. So what we'll see here is the golfer with the left wrist is going to have some pronation and reach a maximum value somewhere in mid downswing, and then supinate during the entire release. Now what's interesting is you'll see a similar pattern, but the supination value will tend to be um, increased on the driver swing. So he's going to get into a more of a supinated position by the end of the release when he gets up here compared to uh, what he does with the wedge. So here's another example and we can look at the actual numbers so somewhere down here um, you know whether that's 60 just below 56 we can see it gets close to 70 degrees of supination by the end of the release now if we look at the wedge swing we'll see a little bit less or pretty close to the same amount of pronation during the downswing but we'll see um, significantly less supination on the way through one of the interesting ones that I saw looking at the amateurs was that this golfer who actually had more supination with his wedge swing than he does with the, with the driver swing. This is also the golfer who tended to have more of a cast pattern with the driver than he had with the, uh, with the wedge. So what you'll see is the more that you load those wrists by using good sequencing, um, good uh, proximal to distal loading patterns, you'll tend to see more of this supination value increase with the release. So this golfer gets close to 80 degrees supination on the way through with a driver close to 60 degrees. And what you'll, this relates to um, a lot of the arm tension that amateurs describe. When they feel like they're bracing or they're squeezing their forearms to help control the club face on the way through or to start bending their arms like they're getting into a chicken wing pattern, those will tend to um, diminish the amount of supination on the way through. So that was just a quick little point that um, I think gets uh, overlooked when talking about the differences between the iron and the driver, but there are definitely some differences uh, between the 
amount of supination in the driver and the iron swing if it's going to look the same on video. And I'll show you what I mean. So we're going to get into some case studies. We're going to look at some 2D examples so that you'll be able to relate what you're seeing on these graphs to what actually happens um, with with uh, you know 2D video, which the way most of us are used to looking at it. So the coaching keys would be looking at the axis tilt, the power source, the release style, and uh, something that I don't have data for but has worked very well for me, which is looking at club height to ground. Now in this presentation, we're going to look at a couple different key concepts. So the fall away from the target or the axis tilt movement um, when we look at the driver's uh, case study and with the iron we're going to look at a little bit of low point training. So here is a single lesson, a before and after. This is looking at um, a case study looking at the amount of tilt. So this golfer, we, we had been working together for a few lessons already, mostly working on the release um, and I'll show you what we did during this lesson to get the changes to go from this over here on the left this amount of extension to this over here on the right. So here's the initial swing. This was one of his swings during warm up, and you can see those arms bending on the way through. Now, here he is during warm up with an iron, and he, he described having some good success with his iron consistency. And most of the pros who I showed this to at the World Golf Fitness Summit agreed that this looks better. He's got more arm extension. You know, there's still a little bit of maybe a scoopish pattern, but he's got much better arm extension on the way through. It looks like he's doing something different with the driver than the iron. But now from looking at the data, perhaps you'll understand that he's actually doing closer to the same thing with the driver and the iron, and that's why it looks different. So I wanted him to understand the difference in the relationship of the axis tilt. So I gave him a drill uh, that we have on the site to help him feel pushing into that front leg while those arms extend past his body and making sure that his upper body fell away from the target a little bit, helping to create that improved axis tilt. So we discussed it and he did this drill, um, took about three minutes in between that first swing and what you're going to see right here. So this was the very next swing after doing his drill and understanding the concept better. Um, and he was able to increase his launch angle and pick up about 30 yards. But the big thing was he was able to control his, uh, tra his uh, trajectory and the amount of curve. He was no longer afraid of the smother hook after um, practicing it for the rest of the session. Okay, so he had been working on the supination and we added the axis tilt and the difference between the two. Now, his iron swing and his driver swing, the release looks very similar, but the important thing is it looks similar because he's now doing different things. If you were to now use some of this information that you've been presented with, take a look at the location of his upper body compared to either the golf ball or compared to the pelvis, and you can see that they're pretty much on top of each other just a slight tilt away. Now over here with the driver, we can, or with the after version, we can see that that right shoulder is well behind the golf ball, the chest is behind kind of his right hip. He's got a lot more axis tilt, which helps produce more of this flat bottom to the swing. Now we have a golfer demonstrating some low point control. So this golfer was uh, struggling more with iron consistency, was driving the ball great. So what you'll see here, I'll let this play a couple times. As you'll see the club working up quickly after impact. Now I had him in slow motion show me the release that he was training and you can see that the low point's pretty much in the middle of his stance and then starting to work up very quickly right through impact. And you can also see that the club face is uh, tending to stay open. We, we've addressed all those issues um, with a cluster of drills and I'll show you here in a second. Now if you're not used to seeing that drill of just like a slow motion release, here's a student who has more of a iron base swing demonstrating kind of the same thing. 
and what you'll, or doing the same drill I should say, and what you'll see is that his tendency is to have the club working much more high to low, where the golfer previously was having much more low to high. So now after doing a, nine, a drill called nine to low point that we use on the site, um, he was working on getting, without letting his upper body lunge, that's why he had the stick here, he was working on getting the, the club to bottom out more in front of the golf ball. So now what you'll tend to see is a little bit more neutral pattern where the club is coming down through contact and then working up on the way through. But you'll see that after impact, the club is lower to the ground with that arm extension. It's less of a club working up pattern. So here we've got both versions. We'll try to get them about even after impact. You can see this is a little bit more of that driver base movement where the club is coming up pretty quickly. This is more of the iron base movement where he's got a little bit better access tilt and that club working more down. So it doesn't have to look perfectly, but if you make some smart adjustments to your pattern, you can make progress with either the iron or the driver. The next goal is then to uh, train going back and forth between those two shots so that you have a better success rate of being able to pull it off on the course. If you struggle with one area or the other, I would tend to suggest with the driver, you would want to focus on axis tilt, the club path, as well as the face to path relationship. I use a number of, of drills on the website uh, frequently to help people with these concepts, mostly revolving around how the lower body works since it's more of a total body activity and how to create the proper axis tilt as well as how to release the club with a little bit more supination to support more of that loading pattern. With iron consistency, I'm typically working on more low point control or face to target relationship. So things such as the open right hand or, or getting a little bit more access tilt and learning where the upper body should be in space and potentially tempo drills work really well for this particular problem. Um, but one of the gold standards I go for with low point control is the arm extension timing and direction, which I, I have a number of different videos to help support. So if you enjoyed this presentation and getting into a little bit more of the, the details of how the swing works, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, like us on Facebook, and if you are interested, head over to golfsmartacademy.com. That's my site where I kind of share all the thoughts of the what I learned from doing classes and what I come up with when working with my students and what I learned from other instructors. So it's kind of my my uh, Dropbox for all the different swing ideas uh, to help uh, amateur golfers and those uh, do-it-yourself style golfers as well as golf coaches. Um, I've got a upcoming book called The Stock Tour Swing which should be around uh, either by the end of the year or early in 2017 and I'm working on a coach's certification. But if you have any questions about anything presented in this certificate or in this webinar or anything else, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me, Tyler at Golf Smart Academy, um, or you could submit a question through the site. Thank you for taking a look at my presentation from the World Golf Fitness Summit 2016 on driver versus iron differences.